Thank you, Teddy, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, lovely to see you all here. As uh, Teddy says, my name is George McFerrin, and I'm the Managing Director for eFinancial Careers in uh, Asia Pacific. Um, I thought I'd start off just by giving a quick overview of uh, eFinancial Careers so you can understand where I'm coming from and, and, and uh, why we have this, uh, the market information today. eFinancial Careers is a job portal that specializes in the banking and finance industry. So we have a large number of banks and recruitment firms that put their, their vacancies onto the website and you can apply for those jobs through the website. You can also put your, your resume onto a confidential database and then that's searched by uh, the, the employers and the recruitment agencies and then they can contact you directly about any opportunities that are available. We're a global organization, so we uh, provide, well, you'll be able to look for jobs both here in Hong Kong but in, in Singapore, Australia, London and New York as well. Financial services, I'm sure you're aware, is a, a global industry, and so we provide a global job portal specifically for, the, for their financial services. So what I'm going to do this morning is, uh, is take you through the current state of the job market and where it has been in 2012, some outlook for 2013 uh, and beyond, and then some tips on how to uh, get ahead in, the, in financial services and, and get that job that you're, you're hoping to land. So... Last year, or last few years, has been pretty rocky in the financial uh, job market. There's been a lot of pain. Uh, the headlines themselves there speak for themselves as the industry has reshaped and resized itself for the new paradigm. However, I think a lot of the news and a lot of the headlines that you've been seeing is very much focused on the investment banking industry. But banking and financial services is a big industry. It's not just about investment banking. It's corporate banking, retail banking, uh, fund management, insurance. All these sectors continue to grow and continue to change. So don't be put off by the headlines. There are still plenty of opportunities within this sector. And as, as the sector changes, more opportunities will, will occur uh, and develop as time goes on. So I think from that perspective, starting to look for a job in, or start out a career in financial services today will put you in a pretty strong position. So what's going to happen uh, in financial services? I think that ultimately, as I said, the industry is going through a huge amount of structural change, but as far as the industry in Asia Pacific is concerned, it's in a very, very strong position. And the financial services industry is set to grow over the next five plus years. When you look at the economic position of the Asia region, it's in a much stronger position than many other parts of the world. And if the economies continue to grow, then financial services will be, very, will be a very, very important part of that process. And I think that there are five key reasons why financial services as a sector will continue to expand um, at a relatively strong pace and, prevent and present opportunities for people looking for jobs in that marketplace. Number one, you've got infrastructure development. This will continue to expand. It's estimated that there's a, a trillion dollars of infrastructure going to be invested in India, ASEAN $750 billion of infrastructure due to come, and there's going to be more across the region. This will continue to drive investment and the need for financing and continue to create job opportunities for people wanting to move into this sector. Government support. Governments will continue to support the financial services industry. They need a strong and reliable and robust and, uh, and stable financial services sector to support economic growth and to finance that growth. So whether it's Shanghai's ambition to become a, a global financial center, the deregulation and support of stock exchanges across Southeast Asia, and all the continuance or the growth of Hong Kong as a, as a financial hub, I think we will continue to see more and more people employed within financial services, and again, creating great opportunity for people wanting to start out their career in this sector. M&A will continue to, to grow. We uh, increasingly see more uh, mergers and acquisitions activity of companies from Asia wanting to buy companies in Europe and in the US. This is a new trend and it's starting to grow. Equally, within inside the region, there'll be more and more cross-border M&A. And again, that will create job opportunities. Deregulation. The increased range of products available will, uh, will require more and more resource to support that. We saw last year in China the deregulation of the, uh, of the structured credit market got the growth of the renminbi market here in Hong Kong and then across the rest of the region more and more products are going to become available this will require more support it will require more sales staff more client relationship uh, more compliance etc so the industry will continue to expand and support the economic growth that is happening across the region and then finally you look at the increased sophistication of customers 
So what do I mean by this? Well, there are two parts to this. You have your, your corporate customers, your companies out there. As they become more advanced and they grow, they want to tap into increasingly sophisticated types of financing products, whether it be to raise money through the, through the bond market or the equity market, or they're looking for insurance, or they're looking for products, pension products for their employees, or health insurance products for their employees. These services, they will continue to grow. You also have increasing private wealth. So as companies grow, they employ more people, they start to pay people more, and we'll see that people, individuals' uh, wealth starts to increase, and that in itself will mean they'll want to tap into their own products, whether that be credit cards, uh, mortgages, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So if you take it as a whole from a macro level, the financial services industry across the region will continue to develop. And the impact of this is that there will be a shortage of talent um, there will be shorter talent in the industry and the industry will continue to want to hire at the graduate level and pull people in to, to come and work. So I think right now is a great opportunity or it is a great time for people wanting to, to start out a career in financial services. So this chart is a piece of research that was done by the Centre of, uh, Center of Economic Business uh, Research based in London forecasting uh, the number of people employed in, in wholesale banking in four of the world's major financial centres. And I think you'll see what's interesting is that they're forecasting that the number of people in Hong Kong and New York is going to fall, whereas, uh, sorry, in London, New York will fall, whereas Hong Kong and Singapore, people working in the industry is going to increase. And that actually, where's the number? But around here, around uh, 2015, Hong Kong, 2016, Hong Kong will employ more people in this sector than either New York or London. So again, plenty of opportunity and so now is a good time if you're wanting to, to start out your career in this sector because there's plenty of opportunity to come. We've been focusing on banking so far. The fund management industry is equally well placed. Financial services, as I said, is a broad industry. It's not just about investment banking. It's about the fund management industry as well and that is constantly changing and there are plenty of opportunities here. Now, again, a growing middle class and growing private wealth will continue to drive this. Plus, a large and aging population will require pension facilities and pension services. And as people get richer, they're going to want to tap into different products, savings products, loan products, uh, credit cards, etc. So all of this would imply that the, uh, the, region, the region's industry is well set over the next few years. But what it desperately needs is high quality talent to, uh, to help drive that growth. So, as I said, the impact, shortage of skills, retention, employers will be looking to hold on to people and make sure that people don't leave. But it also means that uh, Hong Kong and Asia as a region has becomes a magnet for global talent and lots of people want to come and move here as well. So it becomes a very competitive market, which means that for you who are wanting to set out or start a career, it is important that you have the right qualifications and are trained in the right way to make sure that you have the, the right toolkit to, uh, to help you get ahead in what will become a very competitive market. So what's happening around the job opportunities with job opportunities around the world? Right now we've got uh, eFinancial Careers as I said is a global job portal. We collect uh, job numbers and jo uh, job advertising numbers from around the world. So I've got a few slides here that will explain to you what's happening in the job market from in the financial services sector. So this is the UK, this is the number of jobs advertised on our UK, on the UK website in banking. And you can see, oops, go back. This is the start of the first financial crisis back in 2007. You can see the job number dropped off. What we see all quickly, the job numbers peaked in financial services in the UK back in 2011. We've seen a steady decline and we've seen a bottoming out and we expect the same will happen this year, but we expect a more stable year in 2013. Similarly in Europe, the job market in Europe is pretty poor right now. Uh, it's very, there aren't a num large number of opportunities in the marketplace. US similarly, it's a very stagnant and, and, stay and, uh, and low, there's very little demand at the moment in the US. If you look at Asia Pacific, and actually through the last year, compared to the other markets in the world, the job market in, in uh, Asia last year was pretty stable until the final quarter of the year. This is normal. So when you're looking at applying for jobs, you'll find that most organizations do all of their hiring in the first part of the year. Q4 tends to be a very quiet part of the year. Speaking to our clients, we expect that this year to be very similar to 2012 in terms of job numbers. What the, organizer, what the banks are telling us is that they don't have great big hiring plans, they're not trying to expand particularly, they want to keep their headcount pretty flat. They will continue, however, to invest in their graduate programs. They see that as a very important part of their ongoing recruitment process. So 
how's the job market looking in 2013? I think it's looking much more stable than it was in 2012. Um, banks will continue to hire, financial services firms will continue to hire. They're just not looking to increase their headcount. But there will be opportunities for people with the right skills and the right qualifications uh, to, uh, to maximize that opportunity. So here's some of the sectors. So when we look at uh, where we've seen job growth uh, over the last few years, over the last year rather, these are the sectors where the skills have been in particular demand. Risk management, we've seen a significant increase in demand for people with risk management skills, insurance, quant analytics and asset management. All popular areas where despite a, a quiet job market, we've seen the job numbers on the website go up significantly as people look for as companies look for people with those particular skills. So no great surprise there, I guess. So what's happening around the world in terms of application trends? So application flow. So we also, because of our global position, we can look at the flow of applications uh, in and to and out of Hong Kong. And why this is interesting to you guys is it shows you that Hong Kong has become an increasingly attractive place for people from around the world to apply to jobs, which means that it's becoming increasingly competitive. So making sure you have the right skills and you're advanced and you're organized and, you're, and your job hunting is planned uh, is important. And making sure you've taken the right qualifications is, is equally important. So as you can see here, we've seen more and more applications coming into Hong Kong. So the red bar shows the number of applications to jobs from outside Hong Kong into Hong Kong over the last few years. So it's increasingly popular as a financial center. Where will these applications come from? They come from all over the world. But particularly, you know, we've seen a lot of in, uh, increased applications from Europe, France, and UK, but also from across the region, Taiwan, India, uh, show that Hong Kong is an increasingly attractive place for people to come and, and progress their careers. And where are people leaving to? Again, we know that uh, Hong Kong is a great place to work, but it's also financial services as a global industry. So where are the other opportunities that you might want to consider? Singapore is a great, is a very popular destination for people here in, in Hong Kong to apply to jobs there. Again, it's a very similar job market, very similar opportunities, and if you've got the right skills, then you be, uh, it'll be a good place for you to go and try. Increasingly, Australia, and then around the world, people taking their skills and their toolkit and uh, seeing what's out, out for them beyond, uh, beyond the borders of Hong Kong. I put some slides up here on Singapore so you can see that Singapore is in a similar position, which just goes to show that the, the region is a, is a popular place for financial services professionals to come in, uh, and advance their careers. And similarly, Singapore attracting applications from uh, a very similar profile of countries. So how about your careers and how do you go about progressing your career and how do you advance? Job hunting is a process. Rather. To start off with, it's a process. So you need to think of it as a process. But first off, you need to, you need to question yourself and examine where do you want to be in five years' time? What are your ambitions? Uh, and, and how are you going to get there? You need to set yourself goals. You need to make sure you have a plan. And you need to make sure you've got some key milestones on the way so that you know that you're working through your plan. In an environment of opportunity, you need to ensure you've got the right skills and the right tools to make the most of that opportunity. Clearly having the right qualifications is a very important part of that. Having the right qualifications won't necessarily get you your next job, but it certainly helps you put your foot in the door. And it certainly tells people that you've mastered a, a comprehensive and rigorous curriculum and you're committed to uh, progressing your, the, your chosen career. So, it's important to, to think through where you want to be, what particular qualifications you need to get in order to get there, and then you start to build that into your plan. It's important to, have, to think about your brand. You know, who are you? How do you want to present yourself? Never forget that first impressions make an enormous difference. So when you go into that interview, that impression you make that on that first moment, that first meeting, is something that's going to stick with the person that's interviewing you. The structure of your CV, that gives the first impression. So think about what is your brand and think about how you're going to differentiate yourself from other people. Why are you different? Experience is a very good way of doing that. Making sure that you've got some tangible achievements is still very important on the basis that if you've done it before, you can do it again. 
Now, if you don't have any experience in banking and financial services, it's difficult to make have relevant experiences. But actually, there are plenty of things that you will have done in your childhood and your teenage years that qualify as achievements. So don't downgrade them just because it's not work-related. It tells a lot about somebody if you climbed a mountain, raised money for charity. That says a lot about you as an individual. And it's definitely worth making sure you make that available because that tells the interviewer and your future employer a lot about you as an individual. So you know, if you are a graduate, of course, there are graduate programs available. And it's definitely one route into banking. But you need to remember that graduate programs are highly competitive and you need to start thinking about that from a very, very early stage. And there are very few places on these schemes. So I wouldn't want to put you off applying to grad schemes, but at the same time, there are other ways of getting into banking if you don't get on to that highly sought after graduate scheme. You can do it differently. You can start studying relevant courses, you can start taking relevant exams, and there are other Banks have many other different jobs on offer for people who've got limited experience. So don't be disheartened. Other ways of getting it, working through into a career in banking are through accountancy. Accountancy firms provide excellent training and they take on large numbers of people early stages in their career to train up. And having got that accountancy qualification, it is a very useful stepping stone to then take that career on to another stage. So that's another angle that you can take. You don't have to start within a bank. There are many other different ways into it. But you need to think through what you want to do, how you want to do it, and very importantly, what's your brand? You know, how do you want to sell yourself? How do you want people to think about you? Uh, and can you provide evidence to support your brand and who you are and, and what you want to be? So think carefully about that piece. So, as I said, job hunting is a process, and I think that's very important. You need to think it through. I talked about having a plan, and this is really what I mean. There are six parts, I think, to the job hunting process. There's passion, it's having a campaign, it's making sure you have a toolkit, networking is very important, what are your interview skills, and then practice. A practice, 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 and more practice is what's going to be required. So, what do I mean by these six parts? Passion. What is passion? Passion is arguably it's a very overused term. I'm passionate. Well, brilliant. Um, everybody's passionate about something, but you need to prove that passion. Um, interested is great. Very enthusiastic is much better. But just be careful. Don't be fake. Don't overdo it because lots of people are passionate about not very much. So you need to make sure you can prove it. So how do you prove that you're passionate? You are passionate about pursuing a career in financial services. Um, Simply saying it on your CV is not going to get you very far. So think things through. You know, if someone said to you, um, what are the first shares you ever bought? Would you be able to answer that question? Or if, uh, let's say in an interview someone said, if, let's, are you, if I gave you 10,000 Hong Kong dollars, how would you invest that in the stock market today? Do you, have an, do you have an opinion on that? Because I think if you're passionate about a career in financial services, you'll be able to give them a very quick answer on that. Have you been running a phantom portfolio? great friend of mine, he started running a phantom stock market portfolio when he was 15. He's passionate about the stock market, and guess what? He ended up with a very good job, and he's now a managing director of a very big bank in Hong Kong. He was running his own portfolio from the age of 15. Just made it up on his own, picking up the prices at age 15. He was passionate. So that's what I mean by, can you prove that you're passionate about this career? Because that's what's gonna stand you out. It gives you something to talk about in the interview, because automatically, the interviewer is going to start saying, so why did you choose this company? What's the structure of your portfolio? What are you holding long? What are you shorting? And then you have an immediate conversation and they immediately realize that you mean what you're talking about and you are genuinely passionate about financial services. So have an opinion on the stock market, have an opinion on the world economy and be able to back it up. They won't mind if they disagree, they'll question you on it and be sure of your, of your ground, but make sure you have an opinion. Simply say, oh, I don't know. You know, you're clearly not passionate about this industry. So passion is important. So think how you can demonstrate that, even if you don't have any work experience. There are many ways of doing it. Have a campaign. Campaign is, a, again, it's this plan. It guarantees all your bases are covered. If you've written down on a piece of paper or on a spreadsheet all the bits and pieces you need to have right, then you know you're not going to miss anything. From my own perspective, that helps me sleep easier at night. If I'm writing a business plan, I know that I've got all the moving parts in place. I know I can sleep easy because I know when I've got to get everything done. It's similar with a, with a job hunting campaign. If you don't write things down and put the plan together, it's very easy to miss things, do things in the wrong order, and wish that in eight weeks' time you'd done it slightly differently. Whereas if you spend 
a half a day or a day thinking through your plan, you're pretty sure you've got it right. And you'll know you have all the right pieces in place. And you know what work you've got to do. So once you've got your plan, a plan or a campaign plan, it's not static. You've got to keep it moving. You have to keep updating it. And in that, you can set goals about building your toolkit, applications you've made. How many applications do you want to make each week? What kind of companies do you want to work for? Give it, set yourself networking goals, and we'll come on to networking in, the, in a moment. And also, it builds in time for practice. So it makes sure that your six-part process is fulfilled, and you're doing everything you can possibly do to get that job that you desperately want. So a campaign and a plan, I think, is, is vital. The toolkit. What is the toolkit? So I've put up a few things here that I think are important. Achievements. We touched on achievements earlier on. What are your achievements? How can they be valued? How can they be measured? How can they be quantified? Achievements, these are the building blocks of any job hunting campaign. They will appear in everything that you've done, from school to school clubs, to with your family, to weekends. Now, from my perspective, when I'm interviewing people, I actually want to know what people do at the weekend. I, find, I think that's fascinating. I don't just want to know what people do in the office. I want to know at the weekends that they help out with, with, with a scout group, or they help out with a local charity, or they lead a local climbing club. Uh, for weekend trips away. That tells me that they do something in their, in their outside the office, that they're motivated, they're engaging, and they're going to be a real team player because they do more than just sit around uh, and watching paint dry, which is the worst. I don't think many people do that. So achievements are important. So they can be anything, but it is important because people know that if you've done something before, you can do it again. So what's your CV? Two pages. Really, that is more than enough. The people you're sending your CV to, your CV will not be the only CV. They could have received 100 CVs. They could have received 50 CVs. And if your CV is five pages long, I guarantee they won't get to page five. Okay? So think about it very carefully. In this particular situation, less is more. So think about it. And again, don't try and cram it into sort of 0.8 type size and, and fonts to try and get as much onto the page. Make it as easy as possible for somebody to read it because they're reading lots of CVs and yours needs to stand out. So a clear summary at the top of page one is quite nice. A couple of lines, but no more than that. I say here, don't waste space on key skills because your experience and achievement should, it should easily demonstrate the skills you've got. Okay? So if you put down that one of your achievements is building a, 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 a business model uh, with financial forecasting, well, you don't need to say that you're an Excel wizard because you clearly are an Excel wizard because you've just built the business model. Okay? It's those kind of things. Because if you've got that in there, that will stand out. And the interviewer will ask you about it. And there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to, to impress them with your Excel skills. Your online profile. This, obviously, in this modern day and age, is, in, is very, very, very important. Okay? Make sure it's up to date. And make sure it's sending out the right signals. Every recruiter and employer out there will check your online profile. I guarantee it. They will look at Facebook. They will look at LinkedIn. They will look at Twitter. They will look at Google Plus and find out where you're tagged. So weekend photos, weekend parties, set everything to private, guys, because that's important. I've got a friend of mine who's a lawyer, at a, who's a partner in a law firm, and the first thing they do when they see a CV is they go onto Facebook to see if that, that candidate has set their profile to private. And the reason they want to know that is because if the lawyer hasn't set his profile to private, he, clear, he she clearly isn't up to speed with what they should be doing in the modern day and age because they want to make sure that their, their lawyers are up to speed and cognizant of the fact that they shouldn't be making their private life public to clients. And if, it's, if, if the profile is public, then that is automatically a black mark against that candidate. So think it through. And as I say there, there's a survey carried out by Repler. I think it was last year, actually. But everybody's looking at it to screen social media. And it says 69% said that they rejected candidates because of what they've seen. But equally, it's a selling tool as well. 68% said they'd, you, they'd benefited from seeing, they'd made a hire because of what they saw on social media. Okay, so use it to sell yourself. It's not just about keeping stuff private and, and hiding stuff away, but it's also a way of showcasing your skills. So think carefully about your online profile. Networking. So this is how you find the jobs that never get advertised. And it's hard to give advice about networking because everybody does it differently. So you need to think through how you do it. But there are a lot of jobs out there that don't get advertised, especially if you're thinking about getting started. We talked about how graduate trainee schemes are very hard to get into, but there are lots of temping jobs out there. 
There are lots of support roles out there. There are lots of people who need a little bit of help on a project. And networking gets you those jobs. That gets you the six month contract. That gets you in to help on a desk because someone's sick, someone's ill, and they just need someone for a few weeks. That gets your foot in the door. That starts to build your work experience. And that comes from networking. So build your network. Who knows your job hunting? Who do you know? It's families, friends, classmates, headhunters. Make a list and then make sure you contact them. There are networking groups as well. You know, here in Hong Kong, there's, an, there's a Thirsty Thursday. It's a night that happens on the last Thursday of every month. It's open to financial services professionals only, and it's full of people that work in the industry in a bar in Hong Kong. If you type it into Google, you'll find it. And uh, the bar changes every, every month. And then finally, the last part on, on, on interview skills, or the process, sorry. So interview skills. Interview skills is about planning, process and practice. There are three P's to interview process. Planning. Planning reduces your nerves, it boosts your confidence, and it puts you in control of the interview. So think through the interview. Make sure you do your research. Um, again, another story of a friend of mine. He turned up at an interview and they said, why do you want this job? He spent five minutes explaining why he wanted a job as a fund manager. And the interviewer said, well, that's interesting. We're an insurance firm. So that was the end of the interview because he hadn't done his planning. So preparation. There are five, classic, five types of questions. The classic, why do you want to work here? There's competency, tell me about a time when, looking to see if you can do it again. There's the, there's the cutting to throw you off balance. What's your biggest mistake? Um, there's killer questions, the questions you don't want to be asked. Do you know what that is? What's the worst question you could be asked? Plan for it. Make sure you know what your answer is going to be. And then also, your turn. Make sure you've got three questions to ask. Okay, you've got to, you should go prepared. And also, if you, your CV, make sure that what's on your CV you, answer, you can answer questions on. There's nothing worse than being asked a question about your CV and you can't help. I asked somebody, when I was interviewing somebody a couple of years ago, they put on their CV that they're interested in, in uh, art. So I asked them, okay, well that's interesting. So could you tell me the last time, um, the last, uh, art exhibition, art gallery you visited in the last three months. And she said, no, I, I, I can't. I said, well, what about the next six months? Oh, I, I can't do that either. Well, what about the last 12 months? Oh, I can't do that either. I said, well, when was the last art exhibition that you looked at, went to see? And she couldn't tell me. I said, well, why have you put that you're interested in arts on your, on your CV? So automatic black mark against that particular individual. So think it through what you put on your CV, because if it's on your CV, you will be asked questions about it and you need to have a good answer, okay? Practice. Practice is your one minute pitch, okay? Your one minute pitch is if you are given, if someone says, why should I hire you? You should be able to tell them in less than one minute why you should be hired. And this takes real practice. You've got to be succinct, to the point, and punchy, okay? Think it through and be able to sum up in one sentence why somebody should hire you. It's also called an elevator pitch on the basis that you get stuck in an elevator with the chief executive. You've got the, you've got the down of the elevator to sell yourself. How are you going to do that? Because if you've got that straight, that again will give you the confidence. So think it through very carefully. Now all of this information, if you go onto the internet, it's all there, it's all available. You can type in interview questions, but don't just ask. I think as a job seeker, what you might tend to do is you'll go and ask about how to interview tips and how do I, how do I ace an interview. Flip it the other way around, because there are lots of articles on the internet advising interviewers how to interview candidates, you, okay? And that gives you what the other guys are learning about. So have a look at what the other guys are learning, because that's what they're gonna throw at you as well, and that's quite interesting. So, in summing up, practice is, is seriously important. You don't get a second chance, okay? You only get one chance to meet somebody, and that first, that first chance is, is important. That one minute pitch is important, and then practice, 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 and practice. Because you'll kick yourself if you get it wrong when that one minute pitch arrives and you're in the elevator with your future employer and you stumble your lines. And as you walk out, you wish you'd spent some time practicing. So to sum it all up, there is plenty of opportunity in financial services despite the headlines over the last few years. There is plenty of growth in this industry. And if you want a, uh, to build a career, you need to make sure you have a plan and you have the toolkit and the right skills to get you there. But I think 
as I said, there is plenty of opportunity. And if, it's, if you want it and you're committed, you will have a long and fulfilling career in financial services. Thank you.